let's start with a warm up regarding this concept of rigidity with few locations. So you take a graph, which you know that is um, generically de-rigid, and now you want to uh, find a rigid realization that uses only few locations for the vertices. So let's try to see the, for some graphs, we can do it uh, with a chromatic number of locations where the chromatic number here in those examples is exactly d plus one. So look first on this uh, peacock on the left. So this peacock is actually a tree. So that means a minimally one rigid graph. And um, so this means that removing any edge from it makes it non-rigid. Um, that's the minimality. And now being a tree is also bipartite. So you can put all of the red, uh, all of the black vertices in one location and all of the white vertices in another location. And this way you will get a rigid realization of this uh, graph on the line. So here it worked, we did just with two locations. Now let's move one dimension higher. So look on this uh, example on the right. So this is a Laman graph. So it's a minimally two rigid graph. And uh, as you see, it's chromatic number is three, you see a coloring. And we try to rigidify it with just using three locations. So first let's look on these four vertices at the bottom. And so let's notice that if you have a, an edge in the graph, then it's two endpoints must be in two different locations if you want a rigid realizations. Because by the minimality, if you remove that edge, you get a non-trivial infinitesimal motion. And now if you put this edge back, then this motion uh, remains because you just uh, because every vector is orthogonal to the zero vector, which is the direction of this degenerate edge. Um, so this means that for the four vertices on the bottom, we must put them in locations as indicated by the colors. Now the question is, what about the top vertex? So again, it can be either it cannot be gray, but it can be either black or white and or by symmetry, let's consider the black case. But as you see, the two edges emanating from it uh, in the realization, they become just a single edge. So then again, you have a, so now you have a non-trivial infinitesimal motion because you can put zero velocities on all of the bottom four vertices and then some uh, velocity orthogonal to the direction of the edge for the top one. So this shows you that in this case we failed and we cannot uh, rigidify it with just uh, using three locations. So all of what we learned here is that the chromatic number is a lower bound for the, the size of A needed here. Um, but generally it's a poor lower bound. Namely, if you take minimally de-rigid graphs, always their chromatic number is bounded by a function of G. It's just to um, 2g minus 1, but then uh, sometimes uh, for the graphs, uh, the number of locations you need uh, grows with the size of the graph, with the number of vertices. OK, so let's get more formal about our main objective. So let uh, g denote a finite graph and a, a subset of r to the d. We say that the graph is uh, a rigid if there is a map of its vertices into A, such that the resulted framework is infinitesimally rigid. And for a family of, uh, F of graphs, which are generically D rigid, let's also consider a filtration of the family according to the, so let's denote by F of N, the subfamily of all graphs in F with at most N vertices. So now we say the, that uh, the family F is de-rigid with uh, C locations if there exists a subset A of R to the D of size C, such that all of the graphs in F are A rigid. And the main invariant that we consider in this talk is C D of F, which is the minimal such C. So we will be interested uh, in families with uh, interesting families with bounded C D of F. So of course, if the family is finite, then it's bounded. That's not interesting. We're interested in infinite families. And in the case where it is not bounded, we are interested in the growth of uh, 
growth of a CD of f of n as n tends to infinity. Okay, so um, so let's consider first the family of all uh, d rigid graphs. So when I say here uh, d rigid, I always mean uh, generically or infinitesimally rigid. Uh, I mean d rigid just means generically d rigid. Uh, uh, generically rigid in R to the D, but when I specify also the A, I mean uh, always I talk about infinitesimal rigidity in this talk. So, so F of D is the family of all D rigid graphs. And now Fekete and Jordan observe that uh, C1 of F1 equals 2. That's what we discussed about the peacock in the first slide. And uh, further, they uh, show that uh, C2 of F2 of N is at least of order uh, root n. And their argument actually generalizes uh, easily to every d at least 2, showing that cd of fdn is at least of order d root of n. And here is their argument. So let uh, h be a minimally d rigid uh, graph on k vertices. Think of k as a large number. And now we construct a new graph from H by connecting a new vertex to each subset of the vertices of H. So in the resulted graph, we have the old K vertices plus, plus uh, K choose D vertices. So for K large, this is order K to the D. Now know that in every D rigid realization of uh, G, all of the vertices of uh, H must be in different locations. This is the argument we showed also in the first slide, but for the picture, maybe I'll show it again. So here was the case. You see this top vertex. Now it has only, it has those two neighbors, and those two neighbors need to occupy different locations if you want a rigid uh, realization. Otherwise, we have this infinitesimal motion with this vertex. And this also generalizes in higher dimensions if the D neighbors occupy less than D locations. Um, OK. Uh, in a recent uh, beautiful paper of uh, Kirali, he showed that uh, the correct order of magnitude of C2 of F2n is actually order of root n. Maybe we'll get say more how he showed it later. Now let's consider the family of planar graphs. So Kirali answering a question by Walter Whiteley showed that C2 of that family of planar Laman graphs, I mean, always we can restrict to the subfamily of minimally, uh, uh, I mean, instead of, I mean, the answer for planar two rigid graphs is the same answer as planar Laman graphs. You can always take the, in your family, just the minimally rigid ones. Um, so uh, C2 of that family is bounded by a constant, and the constant team found is 26, but it's probably not tight. And uh, in a paper with Karima Di Prasito, we show that uh, C3 of maximal planar graphs is at most 76. So maximal planar graphs are exactly those graphs that correspond to the, the graphs of triangulations of S2. They are indeed generally three rigid, but actually 76 points are enough to rigidify them all. Um, so actually first came this paper with Karim and uh, you know, we sent the draft to several people and uh, Walter asked us about the planar Laman. We couldn't do it, and, but then uh, Kirali managed to do it. And uh, the main algebraic statement that allows uh, inductive proofs for both of those results is the following. So assume you have a framework which is infinitesimally rigid in R to the D. And uh, a vertex of uh, that graph, you have a vertex V of that graph of degree C. Then if you take a generic subset of points in R to the D, which is large enough, and by large enough, we need here of size at least D plus C. Uh, C choose D, then you can find a, a point in A so that you can uh, relocate the vertex V 
in, in this point A in A, such as the resulted uh, new framework is again infinitesimally rigid. Let me mention the key point in uh, proving this. So at first, you don't know where to locate this vertex V. So let's put uh, its locations as uh, variables, x1 up to x to the d. Let's consider the rigidity matrix. So we know that uh, some maximal, um, because uh, we have uh, uh, this inf infinitesimal, uh, I mean, this uh, framework GP, which is infinitesimally rigid, we know that in the rigidity matrix with these variables, some uh, determinant of a maximal square submatrix is a, a non-zero polynomial. So this is a polynomial in the variables x1 to, the, to x up to xd. It lives in uh, the space of all polynomials in the um, variables uh, of degree at most c, because uh, v had uh, a degree c. So in the, this rigidity matrix, only c columns, in, only in c columns corresponding to the edges with v, you see those variables. The dimension of this space is exactly this, d plus c choose 2, it's choose uh, d. So if uh, this is a non-zero polynomial, then you know, if you evaluate on at least so many points or more and you get zero, then it would be the zero polynomial and you will get a contradiction. So that's how the proof works. Um, now let's move on to graphs on surfaces. So let mg denotes the surface of genus G, orientable genus or non-orientable. So. And let a, a f of mg be the family of graphs of triangulations of mg. So the uh, main result, the, res the result of the PhD of, Fogel of Fogelsanger says that uh, all the triangulations of uh, surfaces are three rigid, namely generically rigid in three space. Or in our notation, this means that C3 of FMG is at most uh, Aleph zero, because you can take just different points. And, you know, with Aleph zero points, you realize each graph with just different locations as, usual, as you usually do. But now you want to save locations and uh, in the paper with Karim, we showed that uh, actually finitely many locations suffice. And the constant that we found dependent on G and tends to infinity as G tends to infinity as the genus grows. Uh, now let's consider another family, the family of Laman graphs that can be embedded in MG. So now it's a, you want to real, uh, you know, to rigidify these graphs in R to the two using few locations, and Kirali showed you can really do it with a constant that is uh, of order root g. It is still open whether there is a uniform bound that that fits all the genus together, namely, is there a constant c3 such that c3 of fmg is at most c3, uh, c3 and similarly, is there a constant c2 such that C2 of LMG is at most C2. So we consider this problem and couldn't solve it. So here's an intermediate problem. Does every, play, uh, that, does every graph of a triangulation of a surface MG contains a vertex spanning planar Laman subgraph? So notice that if yes, then this will show that using Kirali's result that C2 of FMG is at most 26. Okay, so initially we want to solve the problem with C3 of F and G. We cannot do it, but maybe it's easier to rigidify them in, in the plane rather than in space. And then maybe we can show a uniform bound. So, and this is the strategy how to do it. And uh, the theorem together with my uh, former uh, master student, Simeon Tarabikin, who just graduated this year, is that the answer is yes if the Euler characteristic is at most zero. So we already knew it for the sphere, and now we know it also for RP2, the torus, and the Klein bottle. And the actual result we obtained there is a stronger. So 
Every triangulation of uh, the projected plane contains a spanning disk. So you can find a a subcomplex of the triangulation. That's what it means. Uh, similarly, every triangulation of the torus contains a spanning cylinder. I think you're 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 fading in and out. Pardon? Bob, I couldn't hear your question. There seems to be a problem. Your audio problem disappeared with... for a second. Ah, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, now it's okay, but it comes in and out. I see. Let me know if it this uh, continues. Um, I'll also try to indicate with this hand where I am on the slide. So uh, even if you don't hear me, maybe you can, uh, if you read my lips, you see that it uh, kind of uh, corresponds to what's written. Um, and now every triangulation of the torus contains a spanning cylinder. And every triangulation of the Klein bottle contains a vertex spanning planar strongly connected two complex. Actually, we understand its topology, so the only few possibilities, let me tell you what they are. It's either a cylinder or a pinched disk, namely a disk where you identify two boundary points, or the connected sum of two triangulated disks along a triangle. So you have two disks, you pick a triangle in each, you take the union along that triangle, and now you remove the interior of that uh, triangle. Anyway, in all of those uh, cases, um, the, these vertex spanning subcomplexes are indeed too rigid because of the strong connectivity that they all share. And hence, they contain a spanning Lama, planar Laman subgraph, and we can apply Kirali's uh, result and rigidify them, say, with 26 locations. And uh, our proof is inductive. And uh, for the base of induction, we first consider irreducible triangulations. So a triangulation uh, delta of mg is irreducible if each uh, contraction of an edge of delta changes the topology. So you identify two vertices. And now the, so now the, the edge between them degenerates to a vertex say the two triangles that uh, this edge supported degenerate to an edge, but and the rest keeps their dimension. And OK, so irreducible means that any such contraction will change the topology. Equivalently, it's a combinatorial condition. It means that each edge belongs to an empty triangle of delta, namely that the three edges of the triangle are part of delta, but the triangle it's, itself is not. And Barnett and Edelson uh, show that for any genus G, MG has finitely many minimal triangulations. In fact, where the Euler characteristic is non negative, so just for those, uh, for the sphere, for RP2, T, and K, all of the minimal triangulations are known. So there are two of them for RP2. There are, um, this is a result of Barnett. You can see the two of them in the picture here below. The gray shaded area is a spanning disk in each of them. Here you see that the spanning disk are actually vertex stars. And in fact, in those triangulations, any vertex star will, any vertex star will do. The 21 irreducible triangulations of the torus due to Lavrinchenko and 29 irreducible triangulations of the Kleinwater Due to Lavrinchenko and Negami, they found 25 of them, and then it was completed by Sulanke later on. Uh, actually, all of the pictures that you see now, except for the one in the first slide, so all of the nicer pictures are by uh, Simeon Trabikin. Um, so on the top here, uh, you see 10 of the irreducible triangulations of the torus. We take this model where you identify Usually, you, take, you identify uh, in this square opposite sides, and then you get a torus. And in the gray area, you see a spanning cylinder in each of them. Uh, at the bottom, you see two of the more complicated, complicated for us, uh, 
irreducible triangulations of the plane bottle, and it's more complicated in the sense that there is no spanning planar subsurface there. And the best you, you okay, what you see here is a spanning pinched disk. It is pinched at C. It's indeed a disk because this AB is uh, identified with this AB. So. Okay. And now our strategy is uh, to do vertex splits. So um, I already mentioned the edge contractions, and you see it here illustrated in the figure on the top. So the edge XY is contracted. And if you re uh, reverse the arrow, that's what's called a vertex split. So now every triangulation of a surface is obtained from an irreducible one by a sequence of vertex splits. So on the original, on the irreducible one, we find this, uh, say, spanning subsurface. And now when we do the splits, we want to uh, extend this surface, spanning subsurface we already had to one of the bigger triangulation. Sometimes the vertex split on the entire uh, uh, triangulation induce a vertex, uh, a vertex split of the surface that will do, but sometimes not. And then we have to do another operation, and this is what you see in the picture below here. So here is part of the spanning surface. The line here with the axis is part of its boundary. And the other operation we can do is to cone over an interval on the boundary of the spanning surface. And you see here that indeed the in this interval is not part of any vertex star. So we cannot realize it as a, a vertex split. So that's another operation. So again, what we want is that the vertex split from delta to delta prime will allow an extension S prime in delta prime of our spanning disk or cylinder, etc., S in delta. Now I want to explain how to extend. And so first, what exactly extension means, and then what we can do with it. So first with the definition. So a spanning surface uh, S is extendable if for every vertex split of delta to delta prime, there exists an S prime subcomplex of delta prime that is either obtained from S by a split at the same vertex as the split that uh, map from delta to delta prime, or S prime is obtained from S by coning over an interval um, on the boundary of S. In both cases, you can see that the resulted S prime is again spanning and homeomorphic to the original S. And what we showed with uh, Simeon Tarabikin is that if you have a delta a triangulation of some uh, surface MG, and S, a vertex spanning subsurface. So here, this will, okay, so this theorem will not apply to the pinched disk. We really want a subsurface with boundary, of course. Uh, then, if you have such S, then S is extendable if and only if the following simple condition is met, uh, which is that uh, this S includes at least one edge from every triangle of delta. And further, in the case it is extendable, then we can find an extendable extension of it. And that's what drives the induction. So now I want to show you how to extend. Uh, maybe first, the easy direction when you cannot extend. That really you need the condition that every in every triangle there is at least one edge in the subsurface. So here you see part of the, your surface, and uh, on it in the, the shaded area is the spanning subsurface. And here is a triangle x, y, z, where no edge belongs to the gray subsurface. And now if you do a vertex split at x that is as, as seen here, that is, corresponds to a stellar subdivision of this triangle, uh, then it's not extendable. OK, so that's the easy part. The more complicated part is when the condition is met, how to extend to an extendable uh, subsurface. And, uh, but you see that if the, this program um, is successful, then um, we are almost done because uh, all S that we chose in irreducible triangulations, for the, the two for the 
projective plane, the 21 for the toes, 29 for the cli. So all of them were indeed extendable subsurfaces, except for the four more complicated, what's called coarse cap triangulations of the Klein bottle. You saw two of them before. There we could find only pinch disks and we need to change a bit our strategy. So let me show you how you extend. So the rule is quite simple. Maybe I'll start maybe with the next slide. So you look on the star of your vertex V that, where, that you split, you split V. Now, the, to define the split, you need to indicate two vertices, x1 and xk, where you perform the split. You see here the split. And so if, uh, now, the, what does this, what's the intersection of the spanning surface with the star of v? It's just, uh, you know, kind of some consecutive triangles, maybe all of them, maybe the entire um, a star of V or just part of it, but they're all consecutive because it's a subsurface. So if this subsurface um, contains one half um, of the vertex star, and by halves I mean according to x1 and xk. So look x1 and xk, so this is one half and here's the other half. So in that example, we contain at least one half, then you just do an induced vertex split. If not, that's what you see here. Here it's not; it doesn't contain a full half. Then you do a coning over a boundary interval, but you need to say which interval, and you have two options here. So here it depends whether uh, the gray area of the subsurface contains the, one of those two, one of those two times. It can have both of them, the ones uh, that are. Con um, uh, contains v, x1, or xk, and uh, if there were two of them, then you would contain one half, and we are in the vertex split case. But if not, then you do another, uh, the interval that you take is an interval for the coning, an interval that contains the vertex v, and here are figures that shows it. So here, here is the, I now follow with this, uh, with this hand, a, a, I, I show you the interval on the boundary of the original surface. Okay, so anyhow, it's kind of straightforward uh, how to how to extend an extendable uh, surface. Um, so we are almost done. What's left are the case of cost cap triangulations of the Klein bottle, and here are the four of them. There we cannot find an extendable surface on them, uh, which is a spanning planar. That's what we. That's the ones we are after. You see that in all four of them, you have this uh, three cycle A B C. It's a non-contractible cycle in all of them, and. Uh, it actually separates, uh, so you can obtain those Klein uh, bottles as a connected sum of two copies of RP2, where you glue them along this, uh, the connected sum along ABC. You see, here is one RP2, here's the second RP2. Okay, and in those RP2s, if you consider each of those RP2s, we can take the triangle ABC to be part of the spanning disk in that RP2. Now to, to see how to, to find our uh, spanning planar strongly connected uh, sub, uh, subcomplex, it matters whether this uh, cycle ABC survived all of the vertex splits or not. So these are the two options, right? So if it survives, this means that all along the way after each uh, vertex split, we still have that the Klein bottle is just a connected sum of two RP2s. In each of them, we can have a spanning disk that will contain the triangle ABC. And now we take just a connected sum of those two disks. And this is, and what we get is a, a planar strongly connected two complex that is spanning. Okay, so that's what we do in this case if the ABC uh, cycle survives. 
The other option is that it will uh, not survive. And uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, in some, some vertex split induced also a vertex split of this cycle, elongating it into a four cycle. And maybe further splits elongated it even further. So what came uh, to our rescue here is this uh, commutativity claim that we can rearrange the vertex splits so that the first uh, vertex split actually is splits ABC. So now it depends where the, the vertex split happens, if at vertex A or at B or at C, let's say at C. So if it happens at C, then as our starting uh, spanning subcomplex, we will take a pinched disk pinched at C. If the split was at A, we would take a pinched disk at A, etc. Okay, so here you see the case, the cases uh, where of all these four irreducible triangulations. Uh, the spanning pinch disks at C. Now we do the vertex split at C. And the point is that this, by this split, we can now resolve the singularity and, gain, and get an honest cylinder. And here is how you see in this illustration, how you get, how you resolve the singularity. You see? So the resulted surface here would be now a cylinder. And by the extension theorem I showed you before, once we have um, an extendable, and, and that will, I mean, it's a it's a spanning cylinder and it's also extendable, namely every triangle of uh, the triangulation contains at least one edge from it. So we can now extend it further by the other, I mean, so further vertex trees will preserve having this property of having a spanning cylinder and that completes the proof. So let me finish with some um, uh, open problems. So first, let's iterate a problem that I already mentioned in the beginning. Um, is, there, is C3 of FMG uniformly bounded? Namely, uh, is this a constant that is independent of G? So that namely, can you uh, rigidify all the triangulations of all surfaces in R3 using only a finite set of locations. Similarly, in R2, for the Laman graphs that are that can be embedded in MG. Now, if for the first question the answer is no, you could still try to do what we did here with the proof I showed you and rigidify it in R2 rather than in R3, and hope that there you can do it with just finitely many locations. And the question is whether the strategy we tried here works in general, namely, does any triangulated surface contain a vertex spanning planar Laman graph? But you see here, I don't insist that on, a, that the two, on a two complex that is part of my triangulation. I have more freedom, and we just didn't know how to use this freedom, but maybe it can be used. So you can use also the missing triangles, the empty triangles you can also use. OK, you can ask similar questions for triangulations of uh, higher dimensional manifolds and even just for spheres. It's not known. Can you rigidify with a constant number of locations? And maybe a most uh, fundamental uh, problem in this direction is consider all the rigid graphs, but now assume that D is more than two. And is it true that, uh, is it the case that CD of FDN is little o of N? Okay, so you have a lower bound on of uh, this root of n. You have the trivial upper bound of n, just different locations for the different vertices. And the question is, is it, I mean, what is the growth? And in particular, is it little o of n? 